our field has come from an end-of-life care since Sicily began things in the 1960s in the Western world. What is that now? About 50, 55 years. During that period of time, the nature of Western civilization has changed dramatically. And diseases that used to be very rapidly fatal um, uh, before and just around and after World War II are now no longer rapidly fatal. And people live with them for years, sometimes decades, before death. And yet our healthcare system has not redesigned itself to recognize this fundamental shift in what's going on in our societies and to design a healthcare system that actually meets people where they are and addresses their needs. So I have no disclosures to report. The, the things I want to try to, to cover today are to make the case for a broad application of the principles and practices of palliative care in care of all advanced chronic illness. I want to review a little bit of the data on what we know works. We do have data on what works to improve quality and reduce costs for vulnerable old people. And in the United States, we talk about interventions that improve quality and reduce costs as high value interventions. That is a high value intervention. Uh, value is quality in the numerator and cost in the denominator. So a high quality intervention is one that makes a big difference but doesn't cost very much. And a low value intervention is one that doesn't make much difference but costs a huge amount, which we do a lot of in our country. So when you're talking to policymakers, everything is looked at through this lens of value, both the numerator and the denominator. And most of what I discussed today will be through that lens as well. Um, and then I want to um, spend the last part of my time with you talking about the fact that we, those of us who are committed to palliative care, are not the audience for our message that our audience are people who don't even know what it is and don't particularly care about it and hope never to need it. Um, and that unless we turn outwards to understand those audiences, plural, and what's important to them, we will not get any behavior change. We won't see behavior change in, among our colleagues in clinical medicine. We will not see behavior change among the public whom we need to demand this kind of care across settings. So um, that's the case I want to make. So uh, you're all familiar with this painting, I'm sure. But until about 1950, this is what we could do. Before the era of antibiotics, serious illnesses like cancer, even infections, uh, doctors had morphine, but not a whole lot else um, until antibiotics became widely available, not until after World War II. And this is the result. Now, Back in the Stone Age, median life expectancy was probably about 30 years. And you can see that right up until about 19, early, ni mid 19th century, early 20th century, when there was much better understanding of the germ theory of disease. And drinking water was routinely separated from sewage. There was a huge leap in life expectancy based simply on access to clean water before antibiotics came in. Subsequent, to, and that brought life expectancy up to, median life expectancy up to about 50 to 60, just public health measures. When antibiotics came in, we gained about another 10 years in life expectancy. So things that often killed um, pregnant women or women giving birth or infants, bacterial infections could now be successfully treated and infant and maternal mortality dropped significantly. And that was the second big leap in life expectancy that occurred uh, towards the middle of the last century. Modern medicine, intensive care units, CPR, uh, chemotherapy, uh, angioplasty, cardiac surgery, at most a two to three year gain. And much of the recent gain in life expectancy that has occurred in this country and other organization of economic cooperation and development, developed nations, has actually been more due to prevention, the treatment of hypertension, for example, um, the treatment of diabetes, reducing cardiovascular risk factors. So where's all the money going, though? Mostly to low-value interventions. 
that don't have much impact on either quality of life or length of life. So I just looked this up last night. Life expectancy in the UK is actually 0.5 years better than the OECD median. So you're, you're doing better as a nation than peer Western developed countries and substantially better than the US. Uh, median age of death in this country is 81 years, 78 for men, 82 for women. Among those of us who make it to 65, the median age of death is now 84 years. And those who make it to age 85, median age of death, 92 years. So you're no longer going to drop dead of a heart attack at 67 or a stroke at 73. And your cancers are going to either be identified early or treated as a chronic disease. So you get to live for a long time so that you can get what? Frailty and dementia. Um, because we all go with something. So this gain in life expectancy, though, from an evolutionary standpoint, this is the news of the day. There's been a gain in life expectancy of 30 years, the uh, equivalent to the gain between the Stone Age and 1850, 1850 to now. Um, and again, as I said, largely due to public health interventions. So I love this cartoon because mine are starting to go. Um, this is, the knees are the first thing to go. Um, and you can see his knees are down around his ankles. So what have we done in response to this unprecedented evolutionary leap in terms of longevity? First of all, we all expect to live a long life. It's considered a tragedy if someone dies in their 60s or their 70s. That's considered very young. Um, we have invested enormously in Western nations in research and have made major clinical gains in early diagnosis, in treatment, and prevention. As I mentioned, we are much less likely to die of a heart attack or a stroke than we were even 20 years ago. And their consequences were dying of the chronic degenerative diseases of old age. All of our countries, however, are experiencing this rise in healthcare spending, which is squeezing out other social goods. So I deleted this slide, but I have data from the state of Massachusetts um, in the United States from 2012, in which over the last 10 years, there has been an 80% increase in healthcare spending between 2000 and 2012, and an equivalent decline in all other social spending education, environment, roads, parks, recreation, after-school programs all cut to absorb the increasing spending on healthcare. Um, and because it is a zero-sum game, we can't just keep printing money. And in particular, states uh, in, the, in the United States must have a balanced budget. They cannot deficit spend, unlike the federal government. So why is this relevant to palliative care? This slide is the reason, and it's the concentration of spending. So in the US, we spend $8,400 per man, woman, and child per year. In the UK, you spend about $4,300. I'm not sure how that translates into pounds per man, woman, and child per year. But that's as if you averaged it across the whole population. But the fact is most people spend nowhere close to that. In fact, 90% of people spend nowhere close to that. Spending is highly concentrated in the care of the sick. And you may have heard the theme that somehow we waste money on people who are in their last year of life. That's talked about a lot in the United States. Why are we spending so much money in the last year of life? As if somehow we know, which we don't. Um, and as if somehow it's not appropriate to spend money on the care of sick people. And the whole healthcare system exists to serve sick people. The insurance system, the National Health Service is there so that we have a safety net when we're sick. So I get very distressed when people attack as waste medical care that is delivered to the seriously ill who might die but who might not. Um, and so I show these data not to suggest that the 10% of older people who drive two-thirds of health care spending in the United States, that we shouldn't be spending that money or that it isn't well spent on that population but rather to show where the public health attention ought to be. It ought to be on the sick, complex people who are facing real challenges and whose health care spending is the dominant force in the health care system. Um, and this patient population belongs to palliative care. 
So palliative care is really critical to improving value, that is quality, improving quality, and reducing waste, because we can't afford waste in the healthcare system. And here's a, a you, I love this couple, this, they gave me this photo. You'll note that she makes her own dresses, and she also <laughs> makes her husband's ties. <laughs> They're really a couple of characters. Um, uh, in our geriatrics practice. So Mr. B, when uh, we met him in the emergency department, was 88 years old. He had mild dementia. He was admitted through the emergency room for management of severe back pain due to spinal stenosis and degenerative joint disease. His pain, he rated 8 out of 10 on admission, and he was taking what you call paracetamol, Tylenol, um, very large doses, doses that were significant enough to cause liver damage um, because his primary doc had said take Tylenol for the pain. So he was taking it and taking a lot. He had been admitted to the hospital four times in the prior six months, twice for back pain, once for falling, and once for confusion and delirium due to unrecognized constipation. Four hospitalizations. His primary carer is his 85-year-old wife, has no children in town. Um, so she was dealing with everything with occasional help from a neighbor. This is what he said um, once he got into the hospital. I told the doctor I never wanted to go back to the hospital again. It's torture. You have no control and can't do anything for yourself. And you get weaker and sicker. Very true. Um, every time I'm in the hospital, it feels as if I'll never get out. And Mrs. B, and this, she was tremendously guilty because he did not want to go and was begging and pleading and crying, don't call the ambulance, I don't want to go, I'll be fine. And she did it anyway against his will. And she said to us, he hates being in the hospital, but what could I do? The pain was terrible and I couldn't get a call back from the doctor. I couldn't even move him myself. He was on the floor. So I called the ambulance. It was the only thing I could do. I want you to pay attention to that last sentence. It was the only thing she could do because the system was designed so that it was the only thing she could do. The most expensive, least appropriate thing is what the system made easy. Everything else was made too difficult. So my point is that the concentration of risk and spending, and I'll show you some data to support this, is among Persons in our societies who have functional dependencies, who need another person to get through the day. Among those who have cognitive impairment, who also need another person to get through the day. Among those with frailty, which is the final common pathway of many serious illnesses in Western society, cancer, heart failure, COPD, and stage renal disease, all manifest towards their late stages with frailty. Um, who may have one or more additional serious illnesses, like heart failure, like um, cancer, like end-stage renal disease, and a very critical factor, often not measured as a driver of spending and healthcare utilization, is the exhausting, exhausted, overwhelmed, depressed family carer who just can't take it another minute. So these are uh, data from the United States that are, don't get a lot of play there, but which I think are really, really important. Um, and what this does is compare annual spending in older persons in the United States based on number of chronic conditions. And the way we've analyzed data in the US is to say the more chronic conditions, the more spending. But actually, it turns out that the main driver of spending is not the number of chronic conditions. It is functional impairment. And if you look at the leftmost bar there, um, it double, it doubles the annual spending if you have any number of chronic conditions and functional impairment as compared to three chronic conditions. And I have patients who have five or more chronic conditions who ride their bicycle. So it, the count, while it's easy to get from claims data, so that's what we use because we can't get function from, from the administrative data we have, um, actually isn't the right measure of the at-risk population. And here's another way of looking at it. On the right-hand bar are the top 5% of spenders among old people in the United States, so the sickest 5%. You have a program here to help GPs identify the sickest 1%. So this looks at the sickest 5% where we have the concentration of spending, and 61% 
uh, the costliest 5% have functional impairment. Yet, nobody talks about it, nobody focuses on this population, nobody designs care models that use functional impairment as the trigger for intervention. So what's happening as a result of this in the, in the US, half of older people visit the emergency departments in their last four weeks of life. I mean, that's an incredible statistic. Half end up in the acute care system because there is no alternative, because they don't know where else to turn. Um, and 75, three quarters, 75% did so in their last six months of life. And much of this utilization is driven by dementia. And I, I know there's a lot of numbers on this slide. But on the right is no dementia, older people without dementia. On the left, um, dementia population. This was a prospective cohort of community dwelling older adults using um, population-based data. And you can see there's four times as much use of inpatient rehab among dementia patients, 20 times more nursing home use, 50% more hospital use, twice as much home health use, and four times as many transitions, meaning home to hospital, hospital to nursing home, nursing home to home. Dementia is a key driver. And at least in the US in 2010, we spent $215 billion per year total, and this includes families out of pocket spending on the care of people with dementia. And I just want you to note that neither heart disease nor cancer hold a candle. In fact, combined, they do not meet how much money we're spending on dementia. We're estimating that it'll be about half a trillion uh, 30 years from now. And this was published just a couple of weeks ago in the New England <laughs> Journal of Medicine. And in case you are not already worried, um, the future of utilization is pretty grim. There's going to be a tenfold growth in dementia-related hospitalizations between 2000 and 2050, and a threefold increase in need for home and community-based services, at least. These are very conservative estimates, in my view. And here's just a reminder from a, a study old study from June Lunny and Joanne Lynn, which points to the trajectory in terms of function. And here we have um, functional capacity on the y-axis and time on the x-axis. And you can see clearly that, and is, as is often the case with cancer, people do pretty well until the last few months of life. Although increasingly cancer is turning into a chronic disease, or there may be functional decline for a longer period than there used to be. For the most part, you can tell when a person with cancer is entering the last months of their life when they stop being able to go out and they're spending most of their time in better chair. That is not true in any of the other major causes of death. Functional impairment is useless as a prognosticator in all other diseases except perhaps HIV AIDS. So what percentage of us die of cancer? Anybody know? Yeah, it's about 23%. So 77% die of dementia, advanced heart, lung, kidney disease, frailty, all chronic diseases with very long periods of functional impairment before death and death occurring because of some acute intercurrent event like an infection or a fall that you really couldn't predict three months earlier or six months earlier because they don't really look much different. Um, for quite a long period of time before death. So prognosis isn't going to help us to identify people who need palliative care if they don't have cancer. And there are now a number of population-based studies showing that palliative care improves value. Um, several from the UK, from northern Spain, Catalonia, several from the US, showing very significant impact not only on spending and location of care at the end of life, but also several studies suggesting that people who receive palliative and hospice care live longer than people who don't get it, as well as have much better quality of life. And one of those studies, one of the high quality ones that you're probably familiar with, is from a, uh, an American colleague of ours working at Massachusetts General Hospital, or man's greatest hospital, as they call it, for short, um, at Harvard, where arguably they have one of the strongest lung cancer programs in the, in the world. 
People come from all over the world to get their lung cancer managed there. Um, and what they did was a randomized controlled trial, the gold standard for research in healthcare, and they took people newly diagnosed with lung cancer, stage three and four lung cancer, but walking around, working, doing what they normally do, and randomized them at the time of diagnosis to receive both palliative care and best cancer care, or to receive in the control group best cancer care. Now remember, best cancer care is Mass General Harvard best cancer care not exactly generalizable to the rest of the world, but very, very high quality base, base system for everyone. Um, and these people, as I said, were newly diagnosed and not at the end of life when they got into the study. Not surprisingly, the group that got both had better quality of life, had a 75% reduction in major depression, were much less likely to be hospitalized, to receive chemo in their last two weeks of life, or to have a late referral to hospice. But shocking and not a primary endpoint for these researchers and a surprise to all of us and got this paper published as the lead article in the New England Journal of Medicine, which very few palliative medicine studies can even get into that journal, much less be the lead article. They found a 2.7 month survival advantage for people who got both best cancer care and palliative care. And this was such a counterintuitive shock to those of us who don't work in palliative medicine, that it got a huge amount of press. So one of the things that, this is obviously one study, it was several hundred subjects, it was Harvard, not generalizable. It needs to be replicated, not only in other cancer types, but other disease types. Um, but let's just say for the sake of argument that it's true, that high quality palliative care integrated with disease focused care prolongs life. What might you think could be the mechanism of action. What might drive that improved life expectancy? Yeah. So first point is reduced hospitalization. Why is reducing hospitalization better for your survival? Hospitals are very dangerous. I mean, if you're a cancer patient who's immunosuppressed, because of your chemo and your radiation, and you come to the hospital and you get one of our wonderful antibiotic resistant infections like C. difficile or many others, you will die. Hospitals are really dangerous if you don't need to be there. If you don't need an operation or a bone marrow transplant or in, to be in the intensive care unit, stay out. Problem is, for many patients, there's no alternative, as with Mr. and Mrs. B. So one is iatrogenesis, bad things happening to you in the mainstream healthcare system. What might other mechanisms of action be for a longer life with palliative care? Why would depression mediate a longer life? Depression is associated with children's illnesses. Mm -hmm. it's, it's easy to Right. Some people think it's a neuroimmunomodulatory effect, but the main point is that in every single disease process in which it's been studied, Cancer, uh, depression is an independent predictor of mortality. This group had a 75% reduction in major depression and the, anti, the antidepressant prescribing in both groups was identical. The oncol these are good oncologists. They were identifying and treating depression. There was no difference in the SSRI treatment. Something about the relationships, something about being heard, something about feeling like you knew what to do at three in the morning if you had a problem. Something about knowing what to expect. Something about feeling like your family was being attended to. We don't know what the mechanism was. Um, some people say maybe they had something to live for because their quality of life was good so they didn't give up. Um, but we don't know what the mechanism is. We don't even know if this will be replicated. But it's an interesting set of questions. And there are some other studies with supportive trends for improved survival associated with hospice and palliative care. This is another randomized controlled trial. I'm, I'm in Irene's shop, so I'm only showing you randomized controlled trials. Um, this was a randomized trial done at Kaiser Permanente, which is as close to a rational English system as we have in the United States. So it's, it's, a, you know, it's a total budget, it's population management, they can allocate resources where need is. This was a randomized controlled trial of regular home care 
the way the whole healthcare system delivers it, which is time limited and around an acute event, versus palliative home care in the lighter blue bars. And the palliative home care involved nurse practitioners who could prescribe, uh, and there was no limitation. That is, they didn't discharge people once they, quote, stabilized. They stayed in there. So Mr. and Mrs. B would have been able to call their palliative home care team when he was on the floor in pain. And these were patients not only with cancer, but also heart failure and COPD. So it was a chronically ill population. And it's, if you just looked at the left-hand two bars, home health visits, you can see there were three times as many home health visits in the palliative care group as in the usual care group. And in the United States, because everything is siloed, if I was running the home care agency and I saw that, I'd say, well, that's nice. I'm sure they enjoyed those visits. Who's going to pay for that? We can't afford that. But because it was Kaiser and they could see where the money was going across the system, they measured utilization in all the other settings. Physician visits dropped by 50%, ER visits dropped by 50%, hospital days dropped by 80%, nursing home days by 80%. So because they're a rational system, sort of like the UK, they now have rolled this out across all the Kaiser systems in the United States. The other rational healthcare system in the US is the Veterans Administration. And the Veterans Administration provides routine palliative home care to people that are identified as in need for exactly the same reason. It markedly Im improves quality and reduces spending. So now, um, those are just two studies. There are lots of others about models that improve quality and reduce cost, but we don't have time for them. So what I want to do for you now is extract from this series of studies the key characteristics of successful models, um, many of which I was reading about the gold standards framework and the UK end of life strategy last night you are deploying in this country. And the first is targeting. So I got this slide from actually from an insurer, South Carolina Blue Cross Blue Shield. And they talked about how they how they try to reduce demand for health care. Because, of course, that's what they want to do. They don't want you to spend any of their money. So most of the people in this audience are over on the left with demand management. So I get an email from my insurer every three months or so telling me to do yoga or eat fruits and vegetables. That's what you call demand management. <laughs> and it's very cheap. You see on the y-axis, it's the cheapest form of management. If I were to go on a little further down on the right and develop hypertension or diabetes, I'd start getting slightly more expensive management. I'd probably get an email a month. And I'd probably get some mailings. And they'd be very focused on what I can do to control my hypertension and keep me out of the hospital. Because they don't want me in the hospital. God forbid, that's very expensive. So if I fail to pay attention to their emails and I Get an, have a heart attack because I don't manage my hypertension, I jump up in terms of what it's going to cost them to manage my care. They're going to assign a human being to me because it's going to take a human being to figure out why I'm not adhering to my medications, why I'm not refilling my prescriptions, why am I not showing up to my doctor's appointments. They're going to put a person on the phone to me and find out for me, perhaps, that my son is stealing my checks and is an alcoholic and I'm really depressed and I have no social support, and they may be able to intervene in the things that are precipitating it. But it's much more expensive for them to put a human being in place. Then if I you know, have a witness cardiac arrest on the outside, I'm resuscitated in the field, spend four weeks in the <laughs> CCU and three months on rehab, to manage me and keep me out of the hospital is going to cost them even more. So the costs of management rise exponentially with the increase in complexity of the patient. And what the point here is, is that this is very expensive. This is a, a nurse coming to my house and checking on me and evaluating home safety and refilling my Mediset once a week and making sure that somebody calls to remind me to take my meds, much more expensive. If you applied something this expensive to somebody down here, you'll bankrupt the system. So you only want to apply these very costly but effective interventions to the highest risk group. So that means you've got to be able to target, you've got to be able to know who the highest risk group is 
accurately and prospectively before they start accruing lots of spending. Um, and there are a couple papers that I found that estimate that in people over age 65 in Western developed nations, so this is not poor nations, that the prevalence of palliative care needs ranges anywhere from 1% to 7%. That's really high. This is why in the UK they're asking GPs to identify their 1%. Their 1% that's at really high risk of complications and utilization. And there are a number of different mechanisms out there, one of which is the prognostic indicator guidance that's part of the gold standard framework in the UK. Um, and they all contain mostly the same kind of measures. And you'll notice here that while comorbidities like heart failure or cancer is on the list, it's only one, that the predictors are things like functional impairment, being frail, having been in the hospital in recent past, um, having cognitive impairment or pressure ulcers, um, and having a goal to remain home. So these, if you use these screening tools, if your GPs use these screening tools in their practices, they will identify that group that's at very high risk and in whom greater in investment needs to be made to manage their care. And this is just a Kaplan-Meier statistic, a survival curve, comparing survival in different frailty levels. So the mild and moderate frailty, you can see 80 to 90 percent are still alive at one year. But severe frailty, something like 57 percent are alive at one year. But 57 percent are alive. Okay, it's still not telling you who's going to die quickly. It's telling you who's at high risk for utilization and complications. And I thought this was an interesting study because it asked GPs in northern Spain to identify people in their own practices whom they would not be surprised if they died within the next year. This is the famous surprise question that Joanne Lynn developed, which is actually quite an accurate prognosticator. Um, and just look here at who, who most of the people were who they wouldn't be surprised if they died in the next year. Frail people and demented people. Between the two, 55 percent of the people that GPs wouldn't be surprised about not cancer, not chronic cardiac disease, not chronic renal disease, frailty, and dementia. So clearly, I think the take-home message is we need the skill sets of geriatricians who have expertise in these frailty and geriatric syndromes, and we need the skill sets of palliative care, and they need to be brought together and aligned in a manner that will both identify and then address the needs of these populations. So that's the first key characteristic is targeting, identification and targeting of the highest risk group. The second key characteristic is goal setting. And here's where I think palliative care makes a huge contribution to the needs of the public in that it begins with understanding what is important to this patient and this patient's family and not coming in and assuming that we know. Um, and one, somebody said to me at a meeting a couple months ago, don't ask what's the matter with me, ask what matters to me. Um, and this is what we teach. Ask the person and the family what is most important to you. It's amazing what you find out when you don't assume that what you were trained to do is what's most important to them because it might not be. And this is a quote from my geriatrician colleagues. <laughs> Um, publishing last year in the New England Journal, ultimately good medicine is about doing right for the patient. For patients with multiple conditions, disability, limited life expectancy, any accounting of how well we're succeeding in providing care must above all consider patients' preferred outcomes. And here's where I think the palliative care movement has made, as I said, a huge contribution to shifting the focus of the healthcare system to what matters to people as Sicily did back in the 1960s. Um, this is a study of 357 cognitively intact day center and sheltered accommodation people who were asked to rank order what was most important to them. More than 75% said independence was the most important thing, 
when asked to choose between independence, symptom management, or living, staying alive. And among the group that chose independence, their second ranked highest priority was pain and symptom relief, with staying alive dead last, no pun intended. Um, so I thought that was interesting, because if you come into my hospital, we assume that your priority is the last one. And most of the healthcare system assumes that. Um, here's another uh, prospective population-based study um, in the United States that showed that people who had documentation of an advanced directive, that is, they had expressed their goals, had m markedly lower total health care spending, hospital death rates, and higher hospice use, but only in the highest spending regions of the U.S., interestingly. And here's another uh, recent study looking, uh, asking families to look back after the death of a loved one with cancer and found that just the family being able to remember somebody talking to them about prognosis and goals of care recall of such a conversation was associated with marked reduction in utilization and also higher quality as assessed by the family. And the New Yorker always gets this in a single image. So here's a doctor saying to a patient, there's no easy way I can tell you this, so I'm sending you to someone who can. Um, and this, it's interesting because those of us in palliative medicine think this is a great doctor because he's sending him to someone who can instead of just avoiding the question. <laughs> but um, ideally, all our GPs will be able to have these conversations if we're doing our training right. So key, char key characteristic three is what, what um, Carol Levine, my colleague, calls the home alone problem, the Mr. and Mrs. B problem. Uh, in the US, there are more than 40 billion hours per year of unpaid personal care for dependent people worth about half a trillion in out-of-pocket time and energy. Most of these caregivers are doing things that usually nurses do, administering drugs, wound care, um, taking people to toilet, um, things that require skill. And we also have good data that these family carers are at very substantially increased risk of other disease, of death, and of personal bankruptcy the unmeasured, because government doesn't pay for it, costs of long-term chronic disease. Now, there was just last week released by the SCAN Foundation a um, perhaps not surprising study to this audience that says that most baby boomers in the United States think it's not going to be a problem because their kids are going to take care of them. <laughs> um, and it was interesting that those who have received long-term care were a little less optimistic. <laughs> about whether the kids would do it. So we have a problem in the US because we have no long-term care insurance. People are completely on their own when they need help. And um, there's no plan in place. So clearly, families are going to need help if we're going to keep people, A, out of dangerous, expensive hospitals, and B, honor people's goals, which are to remain independent and at home. Um, and we know what what the characteristics of success are, first, is that we can identify people in advance. Secondly, that Mr. and Mrs. B could reach somebody at 3 in the morning when he got up to go to the bathroom and fell on the floor because of back pain and not have to call 911. Um, that the relationship with the person who's doing the care management be first name basis. That's really important. So high touch personal relationships. The focus on social and behavioral health. People with mental illness, either family members or patients, are at much higher risk of utilization, yet the behavioral health and the medical health never the twain shall meet in our healthcare systems. That's a mistake, because these are the high users. Um, and also we need coordinated conscious integration of social supports with medical care. Again, these are very separate silos in our country, and they don't talk to each other. Very wasteful. Um, so key that's the third key characteristic. Key characteristic four is the prevalence of misery out there in people with chronic disease. This was published a couple years ago, um, and in the U.S., pain of moderate or greater severity that is, quote, often troubling is reported by nearly half of older adults during their last four months of life and is most marked among those with arthritis. 
So my mom is the classic. She can't walk because of left hip pain, but she's too frail for a hip replacement. So, but her, her pain is not due to cancer or any other major disease. It's frailty and degenerative joint disease. And here's a community-based study that shows that it's not just pain. It's lots of other symptoms, and you can see the ones that occur in over 50% of community-dwelling older people and lack of well-being, pain, shortness of breath, discomfort, fatigue, and limited activity. And Irene shared some recent papers from your shop here that showed that people with advanced kidney disease have a burden of symptoms that's at least as bad as those experienced by people with end-stage cancer, and that even people who have had a transplant, supposedly the definitive intervention, also have very high symptom burden. And these people are going to live for years. Um, similarly, uh, your group found a very high distress burden in people with advanced degenerative neurological diseases. And I really liked this study, um, which showed the prevalence of severe shortness of breath in advanced cancer versus emphysema. And you can see it's actually worse in emphysema. Um, and the same level of being anxious and worried. But look at the survival difference. So these patients with emphysema, median survival nearly two years. So the symptom burden is not going to help you identify who's hospice ready or who's palliative care ready. I mean, it, may, it will identify who's palliative care ready, but you can't use prognosis as the differentiator. And then the fifth characteristic is what I call the dynamic nature of risk. So your intervention has to be able to dose up and dose down with the need. Right, so Mr. and Mrs. B needed somebody on the phone or to go to the house in the middle of the night. They needed an expensive intervention during that crisis. Most of the time, though, they're kind of simmering along and doing OK. You need an intervention that can ratchet up and down with the person. In the US, at least, if it's hospice, it's the same dose every day, regardless of the change in your status. So that's very wasteful. In our country, hospice is $160 per day. So if somebody lives five, six months on hospice, most of the time they don't need a very expensive intervention every day, yet we can't dose it down and up based on need. So this is another critical characteristic of successful models. So, so we know what works, or we have good indicators about wor what works. What are we supposed to do? To me, the main challenge is no longer to what I call admire the problem. And a lot of our research is about admiring the problem, describing how bad things are. I think we know things are pretty bad. And in fact, it's a crisis, especially for the people living in these situations. We need to do and stop admiring. We need to implement what's been shown to work in small scale programs. We need to scale and diffuse innovation through use of technical assistance, training, and social marketing, which is all part of the end of life strategy in the UK. And we need to be a voice at the policy table. So I think first what we need is clear, simple, technical assistance. One of the problems in the US, and perhaps here, is there's a bunch of evidence-based models all jostling for attention and priority. And nobody knows which one to use. So our audience doesn't care about the fine distinctions. They just want to be told what to do. Just tell the GP what to do. Just tell the oncologist what to do. Just tell the geriatrician what to do. Just tell the hospitals what to do. They don't want to choose between a bunch of, of models and different research settings. We need to make that pathway really simple for people. Um, we need to help them with risk stratification and patient targeting. We need to help them with knowing when they're doing a good job and when they're not. The second major need is workforce training. And it's perfectly clear here, as in the US, that there will never be enough palliative care and geriatric specialists to even have a prayer of meeting the needs of the huge flow of older people in our society who so are going to meet the needs. Therefore, our role as specialists and as researchers is to train the generalists and help the communities to step up, is to lead the system redesign, is to think about what the public health approach is going to be to addressing the needs of the 
to provide subspecialty consults for the most complex and to build the evidence base through research, which you've got you know, probably the strongest center in the world right here for the conduct of really critical <coughs> policy relevant, human relevant research. The third point, and I think this is really important, is the issue of public and constituency awareness through social marketing. And here's where I have a debate with how you guys are doing public and constituency awareness, because it's all labeled end of life. Um, and so let me begin with what I call the abiding desire not to be dead. <laughs> so Homer, better to flee from death than feel its grip. Shakespeare, the weariest and most loathed worldly life that age, ache, penury, and imprisonment can lay on nature is a paradise to what we fear of death. And Woody Allen, of course. I don't want to achieve immortality through my work. I'd rather achieve it by not dying. And those of you who watch TV in the United States know the show Everybody Loves Raymond which everybody watches. And uh, his wife says to him, Ray, you don't start planning your death. You go into denial like a regular person. <laughs> so here's my point again. We are not the audience. We know that in some reasonable period of time, many of these people are going to die. We can look back at the waste and the poor quality and the excess hospitalization because we have our data. We frame it as an end-of-life problem. The people on the other side are living. They don't see themselves as at the end of life. Their doctors don't see them as at the end of life. Their families don't see them at, as at the end of life. And if we force them to accept that label, they'll say no thank you to our services because they're, they're not speaking to them. And this, you know, this was... The most important thing I learned in my work at the Center to Advance Palliative Care was that I was not the audience. It was a tough lesson. So I think the fundamental shift in message is from improving care of the dying to improving quality of life for those living with serious illness. See how different that is? So I think our language right now is driving the very people whose behavior we want to change away from us. If our goal is to provide person-centered approach to improving care of frail and seriously ill people, the major barrier we face is actually self-imposed. As Pogo said, we have met the enemy and he is us. Many people who need palliative care are not dying, or certainly not dying predictably. Even among the small subset that are dying soon, no one wants to die. And very few are able to accept that label until death is really imminent, like last few days. In my view, the solution is to decouple palliative care from the end of life and to base eligibility on need and complexity and not on prognosis, which I, I hope I've shown you is not a useful means of identifying the population anyway. Um, so this is what one of my social marketing colleagues calls palliative medicine central paradox, which is that minimizing our connection with end of life will actually increase the likelihood that our patients will eventually attain a good death. And the, um, my organization, the American Cancer Society, is doing an ad campaign on, on the Hill, on Capitol Hill, to try to influence policymakers. This is the first run in the campaign. And you can see it's a ballet dancer with toe shoes. And you've got the word cancer in black aerial font. And then just a purple magic marker, dancer. And that's all it says, except the tagline on the bottom. It's a very powerful image and message that it's about the person, not about their list of diseases. The second ad in the series is a three-year-old on a swing in the playground. Um, and it says in black aerial font, stage three. And then there's a red crayon that crosses out the ST. You need, this is why we need professional help on this. I mean, this was like a fancy Madison Avenue ad agency that did the, not the sort of thing that Irene and I could think of. <laughs> so um, we did public opinion research to, ident to create a definition of palliative care that actually resonated with the public. And what we did was a survey of 950 likely voters oversampling among the elderly, among people over 65. 
And we gave them a list of characteristics of palliative care, end of life care, terminal care, hospice, bereavement, um, suffer, relief of suffering. And then they ranked the characteristics that were most appealing to them. And you will note in this definition that there's nowhere is the word death, dying, terminal, prognosis, bereavement, suffering, end of life. So if you ask the public what they want from a care model, they want specialized medical care for people with serious illness. They, advanced illness equal terminal in the eyes of the public, something I can't get my colleagues in the United States to get. Everyone's using advanced. Advanced equals death to the public. Um, and their families. The uh, patients and families was the top rank characteristic, the recognition that families take the brunt. Focus on improving quality of life as defined by patients and families, so goal setting. Provided by an interdisciplinary team, which I thought would be a negative because these people have a million providers in and out, and why would they want a team? But it seemed to imply to them that we talk to one another, which they seem to recognize is not altogether something to be expected. Um, what that works with other health professionals to provide an added layer of support, not the consolation prize, not what you get when there's nothing more that we can do, what you get at the same time as oncology care or heart failure care or neurology care as an added layer of support. An added layer of support is now my elevator speech. What is palliative care? It's an added layer of support for people with serious illness. Everybody gets that right away. No further discussion. Um, appropriate any age, any stage, any diagnosis, and provided at the same time as curative and life prolonging treatments. So this is now increasingly utilized as the definition for palliative care in the United States because it comes from the audience we're trying to reach. It's what they want. And I'm sure you've all seen this. It's this notion that we deliver palliative care at the same time as life prolonging care and that we turn to hospice only at that point when life prolonging care is either no longer beneficial, which is quite late in COPD and CHF and end stage renal disease um, and many uh, degenerative neurologic diseases, people benefit from life prolonging treatment right up to the end in many of these diseases. So making people choose is cruel. And so I think what we have here is a public health problem. And, um, Xavier Gomez Batiste, who works in Catalonia and with the World Health Organization, frames it this way, that we should change our care of serious illness from terminal to advanced and chronic, from prognosis weeks to month, from prognosis months to years, from cancer to all chronic progressive diseases, from disease to condition, frailty, functional impairment, from mortality to prevalence. So, from cure versus care to both. From disease or palliation to disease and palliation. From prognosis as criterion to need and complexity as criterion. From reactive care to screening planned preventive care. From specialist care to palliative and geriatric care everywhere. From institutional care to community care and from no regional planning to a public health approach. And then I, I um, and from fragmented care to integrated care. My next slide is a, a picture of the things that the gold standard framework is doing in the UK, and it's many of the things on this list. So again, because you have a rational, rational health care system, you're actually taking a public health approach to the sickest 5%. I have some quibbles with the public engagement campaign called Dying Matters. Not relevant to me. I may be frail, I may be functionally impaired, I may be homebound, but I'm not dying. So I would argue that that should be changed. But everything else is brilliant. Helping the GPs identify the high risk people, helping them know what to do once they identify them in very um, pathway driven approaches. Um, and then if what you're doing works, what we will see, hopefully in time for us, is the right care for the right person at the right time and the right place 
to help people remain as independent as possible for as long as possible, to enjoy their preferred quality of life, to be in their preferred place, which overwhelmingly is home, to get support for their exhausted families, to stay in control, and to know what to expect and to know what to do. All the things that weren't possible for Mr. B in the US healthcare system. And of course, Cicely began this process, and this is uh, a quote from her. It, appear, it appears that many patients feel deserted. Ideally, the doctor should remain the center of a team who work together to relieve where they cannot heal, to keep the patient's own struggle within his compass. And I think of that phrase a lot, because there's no one right way. There's the way that's right for the individual. And that takes some skill and some time and attention and patience to find out what that is and to bring hope and consolation. And I'll close with Helen Keller, uh, who wrote this wonderful essay that you can find if you Google it, called Optimism. In 1903, she said, although the world is full of suffering, it is full also of the overcoming of it. Mm -hmm.